Hi, welcome to today's event. The History Legacy Impact of Anti-Asian Violence. We'll, begin, we'll be beginning the session um, now. It'll be approximately 90 minutes. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Blanche Colossi. I am a third year student in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I am a female with black hair. I have brown skin and a white blouse. And I use she, her pronouns. So again, welcome to, to the second session of the Racial Justice Conversations, Becoming Agents of Change this semester. Today's topic is the history, legacy, and impact of anti-Asian violence. It was the purposeful intention of the committee to identify panelists, moderators, and openers who are diverse in identity and experience, whose lived experiences and scholarship deem them experts, and whose individual narratives can serve as windows and mirrors of our own. Today's panelists are brave, committed, and open to having both and leading these racial justice conversations. We thank them and you. We hope you're able to review the recommended resources so you can have an informed and fruitful conversation. For the sake of time, we will not present your bios. Bios are located on the website at stjohns.edu slash racial justice, along with photos of each of our guest panelists, moderators, and openers and closers. All questions may be and before I begin, we would like to take a moment to perform a land acknowledgement. Every community owns its existence and vitality for generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy, making the history that led to this moment. Some are brought here against their will. Some are drawn to live their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived, lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Peace and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. St. John's occupies the ancestral lands of the Matinica, Rockaway, Lenape, and Kenosi peoples. We pay respects to the elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us here together today. Please join us in giving voice to these truths at every opportunity. The committee will share a link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about land acknowledgements. To begin today's event, an opening poem will be read by Professor Sharon Marshall. Professor Marshall is an associate professor and the first year writing in the Institute for Art Studies in St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. For her full bio and all the presenters' full bios, she says it St. John's at Italy slash Malabar Thank you, Blanche. My name is Sharon Marshall and I am a black woman with dark brown skin wearing a dark blue flowered blouse, a gray headband and dreadlocks. I use she, her, uh, hers pronouns. So I will be reading an excerpt from a poem called The Son of G.U. Over a New Land. It is by Daisaku Ikeda. And just for some background, Daisaku Ikeda is a Buddhist philosopher who was born in Tokyo in 1928. And he is a founder and president of the Soka Gakkai International Lay Buddhist Organization with over 12 million members around the world, including me. Uh, he is a peace activist and a prolific author and poet who has founded educational and cultural institutes around the world, including Soka University in Elisa Viejo, California, and our sister Vincentian Institution, DePaul University, has established an institute for Daisaku Ikeda studies in education. So the poem I'm going to read from was written by uh, Dr. Ikeda in 1993, after the Rodney King trial sparked massive social unrest and a national debate about police brutality, racial discrimination, and economic inequality. I wanted to read it today because of what it says about the interdependence of human beings in society and also the hope it offers when it says that people can only live fully by hoping by helping others to live. 
The section I'm going to read ends with the expression cherry, plum, peach, and damson, which in Nietzsche and Buddhism signifies diversity and the value of each individual life. Ah, my treasured friends, whom I so deeply love and respect, it is critical for you now to directly perceive the web of life that binds all people. Buddhism describes the connective threads of dependent origination. Nothing in this world exists alone. Everything comes into being and continues in response to causes and conditions. Parent and child, husband and wife, friends, races, humanity and nature. This profound understanding of coexistence, of symbiosis, here is the source of resolution for the most pressing and fundamental issues that confront humankind in this chaotic, in the chaotic last years of this century. The Buddhist scriptures include the parable of two bundles of reeds, aptly demonstrating this relation of dependent origination. Only by supporting each other can the two bundles stand straight. If one is removed, the other must fall. Because this exists, so does that. Because that exists, so, the, so does this. For several brilliant centuries, Western civilization has encouraged the independence of the individual, but now appears to be facing a turbulent twilight. The waves of egoism eat away at the shores of contemporary society. The tragedy of division wraps the world in a thick fog. Individuals are becoming mere scraps, mere fragments, competing reed bundles of lesser self threatened with mutual collapse. My friends, please realize that you already possess the solution to this quandary. First, you must break the hard shell of the lesser self. This you must absolutely do. Then direct your lucid gaze towards your friends. People can only live fully by helping others to live. When you give life to friends, you truly live. Cultures can only realize their further richness by honoring other traditions. And only by respecting natural life can humanity continue to exist. Now is the time for you to realize that through relations mutually inspiring and harmonious, the greater self is awakened to dynamic action. The bonds of life are restored and healed. And blossoms in delightful multitude exude the unique fragrance of each person, of each ethnicity, in precise accord with the principle of cherry, plum, peach, and damson. Thank you, Professor Marshall, for that beautiful, thoughtful, relevant poem. Um, to continue, today's opening prayer will be shared by Father Tree Thorne. Father Tree is the campus minister for Ascension Service and Faith Formation for the St. John's University Sun Isle campus. Although he cannot join with us uh, for today's panel, we will be doing a video of Father Tree's prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, your divine mystery embraces differences, and you call your people to live in peace. We pray for an end to racial prejudice. Free us from the fear of differences. Free our society from centuries of violence against one another. Break down the walls of separate your people by color, culture, or religious belief. We pray for an end to violence and racism, particularly against Asian Americans. We pray for the healing of our nation and for the flourishing of peace and justice on our land. We pray for the life lost, their families and friends, and their communities who may feel unsafe and vulnerable at this time. God of the universe, we ask you to pour your wisdom and love upon us, especially upon our panel. 
open our ears and our hearts to listen so that we can transform discrimination into the passion for justice. Guide us to nurture a society that embodies reconciliation and cooperation among all. We pray all this in the name of our God, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Again, welcome to our event. I am happy to be here as the opener and closer for today's event. I am a third-year pharmacy student here at St. John's University. I have been involved in PARE, or Philippine Americans Teaching Everyone. I am serving various leadership positions. Through this multicultural organization, I have the opportunity to plan and host campus-wide events, educating members about Filipino culture. As the current Vice President of PARE, I am so honored to be here, contributing to this very necessary event, addressing anti-Asian violence and celebration, celebrating Asian Pacific Heritage Month. I am a proud Filipino American, and I am a proud Igorot, indigenous to the mountains of the Philippines. In this photo of Min Lola, previously shown, or my grandmother, at my high school graduation, I have the traditional mountain province cloth decorating my graduation cap. Uh, this beautiful weaved cloth, known as a tapis, is usually wrapped around the waist and worn as a skirt. Colonizers were appalled by this indigenous garb, shaming it as immodest and unholy. But strong figures in my life, like my Lola, taught me otherwise, and wrapped my tapis on me when I was little. I learned to wear the tapis with pride and celebration of my culture. While my Lola may not look like much to others, she is the strong, outspoken matriarch of the family. And it pains me to think that as soon as she leaves our household, she is considered weak and vulnerable. Although anti-Asian violence has dramatically increased during the COVID-19 pandemic, this vilification of the Asian American community is not new. Discrimination, xenophobia, and white supremacy have been at play for centuries and are inherent to the structure of our country. Burdened by this, I used to not share my culture with my peers, confused by my own identity and embarrassed of how it made me different. It wasn't until I entered St. John's that I have the opportunity to befriend others with the same experiences, reflect on the institutions that capitalize off of our communities and engage in meaningful discussions. I am excited today to be at this panel, surrounded by leaders in the AAPI community, reflecting on Asian American identity and the many systems that contribute to anti-Asian hate. I'm looking forward to our panelist conversation, and I hope that this is only the beginning of a constant dialogue, empowering Asian American and other marginalized voices. I'm also happy to introduce the moderator for today's panel, uh, ji Yun Kim. Dr. Kim is an associate professor for the biology department in St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. For her full bio and all of the presenters' full bios, please visit stjohns.edu slash racial justice. Our first discussant for today is Christine Chim. Uh, Dr. Chris, Dr. Chim is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Health Professions with the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. She is also a 2011 graduate from the St. John's University PharmD program. Next is Dr. Susie Pack. Dr. Pack is an associate professor in the History Department in St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Also joining us is Dr. Aldetso, is an associate professor in the English Department within St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Also joining us today is Dr. Yue Angela Zuo. Dr. Zua is the Director and Associate Professor of the Criminology and Justice Program in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology under St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So welcome everyone. I'm happy to hear everyone's discussion and all the discussions conversation. I will now be passing over the conversation to Jian. Hello everyone. My name is Jian Kim. I'm a teaching faculty in biology. I am a first generation Korean American. I arrived in the US 35 years ago and lived in the larger portion of my life here. 
I am a female of Korean descent, middle age with graying brown hair tied in the back, and I wear eyeglasses. Today, I'm wearing a dark uh, pink shirt, and I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Thank you for joining us on the second St. John's University's panel conversation. Today, we're going to talk about anti-Asian racism. The first uh, event was uh, from the Office of uh, Multicultural Affairs, and uh, they had presented combating anti-AAPI hate. We're still at the beginnings of these significant conversations. Please bear in mind that after the session, the conversation will continue in many forms. And today's conversation may include some graphic nature and may take all of us to upsetting and stressful places. Behind me uh, is an illustration from the website Stop Anti-AAPI Hate. It is a reporting center documenting anti-Asian racist incidents. It was an action uh, started by Russell Jung, a professor of Asian American studies at San Francisco State University. He started this in mid-March uh, last year in 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started in the US. And in fact, one day after the start of the political rhetoric, the term China virus was born, among other racially toned ones. And since then, as of one year later, March uh, this year, about 4,000 incidents were recorded to the site. As our nation coped with a pandemic, breaks in mental health and racism surged. Black Lives Matter movement demanded to address the systemic racism in all sectors of our society, including the higher education. Over a year, compared to pre-pandemic years, the number of reported anti-Asian crimes increased exponentially some 150% across the nation, often targeting the more vulnerable elderly and women. Crimes escalated from vandalism to simple property damage to verbal harassment then to physical assault, culminating just a month ago in mass shootings at spas in Georgia run by Korean Americans where six out of eight victims were Asian women, and uh, may I add, elderly women. And recently at a FedEx facility in Indiana, where four of eight victims were Sikhs of South Asian descent. We start by asking the central question, as in Vincentian University that we are, what must be done? Indeed, what must we do? What can we do? How can we come together in action as a community of interfaith, multiracial, multicultural coalition and solidarity to work towards justice? How can we listen closely, learn properly and correctly and ask the right questions to choose the strong and peaceful but effective actions? Today, we have invited experts from within our own university community as panelists to address these questions. Throughout the session, we ask our participants to ask questions in the Q&A, and we will have a chance to ask many of them, time permitting, during this session and leave others for future sessions. Our blurb says, by examining the history and legacy of this anti-Asian violence, we will explore the impact of discrimination, violence, and crime on Asian American communities. But you can switch out the Asian American to other communities as well, their families and the health outcomes, their sense of our sense of belonging and safety, our opportunities and our responsibilities. We will come together today to discuss ways to find unity and to actively engage with these challenges. There has been a wave of violence against Asian Americans over the last year. To what extent do you see continuity with the past in this regard? And to what extent are recent events different? Is this just a continuum 
which is better reported, or is it a real surge? If it is a continuum in some ways, what has been done in the past to stop it? And why was it not successful in preventing recurrence? What are some of the myths and the stereotypic caricatures that contribute to racism? What is the role of the media? To address these questions, I will ask professors Elda Tso and Susie Pack. Elda and Susie, take over. Hi. Hey, everyone. So, Elda, do you want to yeah, uh, share off your screen? While, while you're doing that, I'm just going to introduce myself and then you can introduce yourself. Yep. Yep. Uh, my name is Susie Park. Hello and every, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm a member of the Department of History in St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, I am a Korean American uh, middle aged woman. Uh, my hair is pulled back. I'm wearing a white round glasses and I have a red crew neck sweater on. Uh, Elder, and, oh, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Elder, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yes. so hi everyone. I'm Elder Zhou. I'm a professor in the English department. I am also a middle aged Asian woman, light skinned, short hair, wearing black. So can you make the, the PowerPoint bigger? bigger where you do full screen? Okay. Go down it's to the, you know, the thing on the bottom. Is it this? Wait, it won't do it. You see where the there's a slider that thing right next. Yeah. Oh. Right next to the slider, to the left. This thing. Oh, to the left. Yeah, to the left. Yeah, hit that slideshow. Okay, you're gonna have to tell me how to move forward. I'm sorry, everyone has to hear this. You see, we are not model minorities. Uh, I think you can just use the, the arrow for oh, yeah, the bottom left. Yeah, on the bottom left. It. Okay, perfect. So, um, well, one of the things Professor Zoe and I talked about, um, what is how, how do we put this? So, Professor Zoe teaches Asian American literature here, um, in the Department of English. I teach Asian American history here. We actually both studied with uh, Gary Okihiro, who was at Cornell and at Columbia, as one of the most senior historians um, in the field of Asian American studies. And so when we were talking about what, if we were to try and condense basically what our classes were fundamentally, we thought was important for people to know, assuming that this would be kind of a basic review, um, we thought we had to start, frankly, with the definition of what we mean by Asian. And with the definition of what we mean by the Orient, um, because this is always how I start my classes that we, we cannot assume the, this, this, um, wholeness or the natural identity of something called Asian or the Orient. So, um, Elda, why don't you start with the slide and then we'll go into the history. Okay. All right. So, um, if you notice, I've put Oriental up there. Um, and what Dr. Pak was just talking about is this idea that the Orient, the so-called East or Asia, neither one of those are real categories, but they are, as you see in the quote up here from Edward Said, a European representation. That is, it is the West representation of the East. It is not actually the East. But those directions, if you think about, are also constructed because in the globe, there's no West or East. Right, so it depends on where you set your point of departure. And if you start with Europe, then Asia is, of course, East. But if you start with Asia, then West would be East. Right, so that's the first thing to, to understand that it's a constructed idea, but also that it has a whole long history that we can trace all the way back to the ancient Greeks. And one important um, characteristic of it is, and we'll, I want you to look at this um, quote up here, is that the Oriental defines oriental and racial opposition to whiteness. Only the racialized oriental is yellow, Asians are not. So the first point is the second half where Robert Lee makes the point that Asians, actual people belonging to the so-called area called Asia, even though they may not understand themselves as Asian, but understand themselves as Chinese or Filipino or Korean, 
that Oriental is a race that's constructed. So that's what he means by racialized and that's yellow, right? This is part of the kind of definition of what an Oriental is. An Oriental is a perpetual foreigner. An Oriental is completely other. An Oriental is alien, is exotic. But all of those qualities only emerge in opposition to the West or to whiteness defined as its opposite, as rational compared to the mysterious East, as mainstream compared to the inassimilable, right, as native compared to the foreign other, the foreign Asian. And so one, one of the, uh, one way in which we see this heritage of the Oriental show up is if you look at the bottom of the screen is what's happening right now with this anti, this most recent wave of anti-Asian violence um, with, with COVID. So there, um, Erica Lee, the historian, mentions that a, by stigmatizing Asians for their purportedly diseased bodies, filthy living conditions, hyperfertility, immoral habits, white native, nativists cast them as social inferiors and use these arguments to push for racial segregation. So this is another point that Dr. Pak um, makes, which is it's not only that these ideas are created, but that they are also made through policies through laws, through various kinds of institutions that make it happen, right? So if you look um, at this, at the um, right bottom of the screen, um, I've given you just some very, very early examples of how Asians have been scapegoated or have been stigmatized as dirty or disease bearing. So we see right now with the racist definition of, you know, the Wuhan virus or the Chinese virus, which is against WHO rules, um, but you see early in 1871, the Chinese were accused of introducing leprosy, which of course is not a Chinese disease. In 1900, um, the uh, two, ch uh, two Chinatowns, one in Honolulu and one in San Francisco, experienced plague and it was only Chinatown that was burned down and Chinatown that was quarantined, even though the plague was, you know, all over the place in addition to, you know, those white neighborhoods. And so part of this kind of understanding of the, the Oriental isn't just that it's the West representing the East, it's that the West has dominated the East and controlled the source of representation such that those who might be forced under that category understand themselves as Oriental. And so this is that last quote from the, um, the post-colonial scholar Edward Said who wrote this book called Orientalism. Uh, and he's describing himself. Uh, my study of Orientalism has been an attempt to inventory the traces upon me, the Oriental subject. Thank you, Dr. Park, <laughs> my helper. Um, of the culture whose domination has been so powerful a factor in the life of all Orientals. So this is the other half of Orientalism, that it's not just about pointing out, oh, here are Western constructions of the East, but also to trace, so how have those constructions then been internalized? by people who would not naturally fall under this category. All right, Dr. Pak, I, I direct it back so to you. I think you, could, I think you can move to the next slide, but what I wanna pick up on what Dr. Zhou was saying. So to answer the question by Narissa in the Q&A, is Oriental considered derogatory? I would say yes. I think Oriental is considered kind of a 19th century term um, that we do not use anymore. Um, and we're gonna get to another slide where we talk about Asian American. But the key thing, and, and uh, what I feel like Dr. Zoe is saying, is that the idea of the Oriental as a representation of, of another is really the representation of the idea of how the West sees itself, right? So the idea is that it is an idea that the West has of itself that is projected onto real people that could we say live in a territory that has been identified as Asia, that they may not have at one point even identified themselves as Asia, for example. So, and we can see this in, in history through, for example, colonial relations, through laws and policies. And so, but it's very important to, to recognize, and, and in my classes, I always show this one clip from Peter Davis's Hearts and Minds in 1974, where he, talks about uh, a general who's talking about the Vietnam War, um, and you basically see a, a kind of litany of tragedies and Vietnamese uh, peoples mourning um, their families, their children, their mothers, their fathers who have been killed by American bombs. And then you cut to this general, General uh, Westmoreland, who says, 
Well, the Oriental doesn't value life. Life is cheap in the Orient. And it's so clear that what Davis is saying is he's saying that idea of the Oriental is a reflection of Westmoreland's idea. It is not something that exists in the real world, right? But the other thing that is very clear is that the idea of the Asian as a perpetual foreigner outside of the United States was created through laws, through violence, through history. It's a historical process. And so this is covered very extensively. You can see some of the um, events that Dr. Zill listed in the PowerPoint, right? The riot by white miners against, um, no, keep going, Elda, to the next slide. Oh, to the violence? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Oh, to, to that one. Yeah, stay on this one for a second. Um, where she lists the Rock Springs massacre, for example. This is covered extensively in, for example, I'm just going to show you again, this book by Beth, Beth Lou Williams, which is called The Chinese Must Go. I can't even tell you how many texts you could possibly read about just the litany of anti-Asian violence. And of course, one of the most important that we're going to come back to um, in the contemporary period um, is that predates Atlanta uh, by several decades is the murder of Vincent Chin, who was killed in 1982. Um, and one of the reasons why this was so significant is that the people who killed him never served a day in jail. So it was, an, but it leads to what we'll call the Asian American movement. But the key that we want to really impress upon you is that the creation of this idea of the, the Oriental or the Asian as excluded from, separate from, different from, American, right? So this is one of the dominant kind of themes in Asian American studies um, is actually a historical process. It happens in history. You can chart it over time. So Elda, if you go to the next uh, slide, I'll just give you uh, an example. When we, when we look at questions about citizenship, for example, okay? So citizenship in the United States, um, if you were to date it, goes back to, it's not uh, codified until the 14th Amendment um, in the original constitution. So for if, in order to be a citizen of the US, if you, if you were not born here and you were going to naturalize, you had to be a free white person, obviously referring to the fact that this was a country in which we had slavery. Right. So in 1790, um, the Naturalization Act was passed that said free white person. In 1870, after the end of the Civil War, this was amended. This had to be amended. And there was a question in Congress about whether or not they were just going to strike the word white or they were going to add to it. Right. So in, and, and this was a, a, a debate that really was centering around what is the position of Chinese Americans, right? And and what they decided to do is they just added persons of African descent rather than striking the racial um, uh, categories or requirements for citizenship. This is not undone, it, and it becomes uh, uh, codified in the 1882 Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act, that literally says Chinese cannot naturalize. And so what happens is the process is that there, there is a new term that emerges, and that is the term of the alien, right? And the idea of the alien who cannot naturalize, which becomes a code basically for Asians, right? And so if you can see the other um, events that Dr. Zhou has listed, the Page Act in 1875, the Exclusion Act, which I just mentioned, the alien land laws, which prevented aliens ineligible for citizenship from owning land. The 1924 Immigration Act that created an Asiatic barred zone, um, and uh, uh, but also uh, so expanded the Asian Exclusion Act to a much wider territory, including, for example, India, and and also uh, barred Asians from entering where other countries. It was really also directed towards Southern and Eastern uh, Europeans. Um, Jews, Italians, to limit the numbers that came in um, from Southern and Eastern Europe to a quota based on those already in the United States, but before, I believe, the 1890 uh, census, right? And so then we have, of course, the um, executive order during the Second World War, which in turn Japanese Americans, 120,000, the, the majority of whom are actually American citizens. These are not undone until formally 
until 1965, when there's an immigration act that abolishes the national quota orders. But what we have is we fundamentally have decades and decades of history that we then have to contend with. One of the things that Bethel Williams says in her book is that consider the number of Chinese who did not come to the United States because of reports of violence, because of how difficult it was made. The, the women who stayed at home because of the Page Act, because they did not want to be subjected to this uh, idea that they were prostitutes, right? That they were um, exploited indentured labor. And so what ends up happening is that the face of America is actually altered because of all of these. So when, because of all of these acts, as a result, when we think of what Asian America looks like today, we're looking at that legacy, right? We are literally living with that legacy. It is invisible, so, uh, but it's no less real. So this idea that we can just undo things during the Johnson administration, now the Naturalization Act, uh, I mean, the Immigration Act is passed, doesn't entirely contend with what we've ended up with. One example is this idea of aliens and eligible for citizenship Two cases that were really important in the 20s that I talk about in my classes is the case of Takao Ozawa versus the United States. Takao Ozawa, so there is a very, think about it. If Asians cannot become citizens, naturalize and become citizens, you can vote. So your political power was very limited. But what we see in the history of Asian American uh, in the US is that they turn to the judicial system to try and advocate for their rights. So some of the key cases in terms of the US Constitution actually have to deal with Asian Americans, right? US versus Wong Kim Ark, 1898, reaffirmed birthright citizenship and the 14th Amendment, the, the, the um, application of the 14th Amendment to non-citizens and also reaffirmed that birthright citizenship, no matter what your race. These two cases, uh, Takawazawa versus the United States, where Takawazawa tried to say that um, he was according to the, the definition of whiteness, that he was white, they said, no, you can't be white because you're not Caucasian. The next year, the United States tried to and revoked the citizenship of Bhagat St. Tint, who was an Asian Indian man served in the First World War, had was a citizen, had naturalized. They revoked his citizenship saying, well, racially you are Caucasian, but you are not known as white by the common man's version of, by the common white man's version of of whiteness, and so therefore you cannot be a citizen. And what it shows you is that the ideas of whiteness, the ideas of citizenship, um, were quite arbitrary, right? The, and, and, and it shows the idea of race itself was historically uh, constructed. So if you go to uh, the next slide. Hold it. Right. Do you want to go back to the violence one? No, I think that we can just in the interest of time, what we should do now is we want to talk a little bit about how the um, I, the historical identity of Asian American um, comes to being in the 20th century. So, Elder, okay. You? So, Dr. Paka set me up for this term Asian American, which was an invented term by student activists. Uh, in the 1960s as a conscious effort to push back against that entire racist legacy of being framed as an alien, as an Oriental, as being exotic, and to also, in some sense, to claim their Americanness, right? It's Asian Americans. But also, if you look at this quote up there, that it wasn't just the Asian American movement in isolation. It was working together with other movements, with the civil rights movement, with the black student movement, with uh, with the Filipino student movement, with, with the Mexican American, and we'll talk about this later on with the Third World Liberation Front. But you notice that what they share in common is this desire to represent themselves rather than be represented, but also this shared history of struggle against white supremacy and U.S. imperialism, that those two are the resounding anchors that tie all of these racial minorities together. And so Asian American is both very, very historically specific, right? 1960s, uh, invented by these students, initially based in, in the U.S., but it also opens up into the transnational, right? 
U.S. Uh, imperial activities elsewhere. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit. But the first thing that I just wanted to direct your attention to is this um, is this anthology called IE, and this was one of the 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 most famous or notorious definitions of what Asian American is. And uh, I'm going to read this out, but just um, think about what it's saying about gender and about sexuality here in this um, in this term in this description. So our anthology is exclusively Asian American. That means Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese Americans. American born and raised who got their China and Japan from the radio, off the silver screen, from television, out of comic books, from the pushers of white American culture that pictured the yellow man as something that when wounded, sad, or angry, or swearing, or wondering, whined, shouted, or screamed, aye. So a couple of important things that, that first, the definition of Asian American, of who counts under that category, changes. Right, so this is one of the initial efforts to sort of define Asian America. But as we'll talk about later, it's an incredibly heterogeneous and actually a category that's always falling apart, right? It's, it's always dissolving because it's too heterogeneous. And therefore, it shows you how artificial the category is, but how real in terms of the legal history, right? The discrimination that's, that's shared. But also, if you look here, um, this notion that these Asian Americans got their idea of Asia from the West, right? And that they have been represented as this, you know, wounded, emasculated, um, you know, sad uh, uh, individual who can't even speak a language, but can only make a noise, i.e. But if you know, the name of the anthology is also i.e. Right, so this is in part and parcel of the term Asian American that it is an attempt to turn this racist legacy against itself. We're going to reclaim this term, right? So that's the that's the sort of key IE from the 1970s. Um, and then moving here, uh, I just want to talk about this heterogeneity, hybridity, and multiplicity, in which Lisa Lowe, um, one of the very well-known cultural theorists, in her book Immigrant Acts describes just how heterogeneous that category is, right? We often think, especially in the media, the way it, that it portrays Asian Americans as mainly just one type, right? As monolithic, as just the model minority, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But as you see from the quote from Lisa Lowe, this is a, a category that contains multitudes, right? So I'm just gonna read that quote out for, for you all. From the perspectives of Asian Americans, we are extremely di different and diverse among ourselves as men and women at different distances and generations from our original Asian cultures, cultures as different as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Indian, Vietnamese, Thai, or Cambodian. Asian Americans are born in the US, born in Asia, of exclusively Asian parents, of mixed race, urban and rural, refugee and non-refugee, fluent in English and non-English speaking, professionally trained and working class. And the composition of different waves varies depending on when they come and the circumstances under which they come. And so one thing that I want to note is that these various peoples, right, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Indian, Vietnamese, and that's just a tiny little listing of, I think it's a, approximately, the census says about 50 different ethnic groups that fall under this category of Asian. They do not themselves share a kind of unified sense of identity. In fact, there is uh, histories of, of antagonism and colonization between them, for example, Japanese and Korean. And so that points to this notion then of panethnicity, which is a term that Yen Leia Spiritu came up with to describe how these various groups, these various ethnic groups band together, right, in a kind of coalition in order to agitate for rights. Um, and they band together, not because they are naturally tied together. It's because they've been lumped into one category. And the one thing that unites all of them is that they're designated as Asian and designated as aliens ineligible to citizenship. All right. Susie, back The other to you. thing that I want to mention that Yen Lea Spiritu talks about in her book, Asian American Panethnicity, is the significance of violence in the creation of the Asian American community. So one of the galvanizing moments actually in the in the creation of this kind of Asian American um, community identity after the original 1960s, which really comes out of the civil rights movement and the student movement and the movement for ethnic studies, it, and also frankly against the Vietnam War and uh, critique of American and European colonialism is the murder of Vincent Chin, 
that happens in 1982 because it becomes very clear to Asian American activists on the ground that um, this murder is not unique. So what when Chin was murdered, it was he was an engineer in Detroit. It was the day before he was going to get married. It was a bachelor party, and the the two men who uh, murdered him, Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz, uh, basically said uh, called him a a, a jack. Right, which is a derogatory term. He's clearly he's Chinese American, right? Um, uh, but it didn't matter to them. They blamed him um, and the Japanese for. Um, and this is where you know the global kind of racial uh, capitalism critique must come in for taking their jobs away uh, from factories in in Detroit, where the auto industry had been so dominant. And that was the kind of backstory. That was the story that they told, that their understanding of why it was okay to murder him in cold blood with a baseball bat in the parking lot of a McDonald's, right? The day before he was going to get married. And that's that case is actually still uh, ongoing. There's a wonderful film about it on Canopy Streaming for St. John students. If you'd like to see, it's called Vincent Pu, uh, directed recently by Curtis Chin, and actually talks about how Vincent has been forgotten, right, by by contemporary Asian American. And, and American society and why we need to re remember him uh, 30 years later. But uh, Elder, do you wanna move forward? Okay. And just to pick up on um, what um, Susie was saying about how Vincent Chin has been forgotten, you'll notice that in a lot of the sort of media talking heads, there's a surprise that, you know, this is this new wave of, of anti-Asian violence. Um, and which is why, knowing Asian American history is so important, which is why you should take our courses, uh, to see that this is part of an undercurrent that's built into the infrastructure, right? This is only a uh, the most visible kind of spike, but that this sort of violence has been built into the, that's how the category got made up in the first place, right? And, um, and part of the, the attempt to erase that category, um, especially on the part of, of America, is this creating of this category called the model minority, right? So most of the representations of Asians in the in the media is that they are model minorities, they don't experience discrimination, most of them have achieved economic parity with whites, and therefore they don't really count as minorities at all. But also, if you look up here at this quote, this is one of the, the first uh, invocations of the term model minority. At a time when it is being proposed that hundreds of billions be spent to uplift Negroes and other minorities, the nation's 300,000 Chinese Americans are moving ahead on their own with no help from anyone else. Right. So you notice that date is 1966. This is at the height of the Cold War. So the creation of this category model minority has two faces, right? One, it's it's sort of you know outward facing, right? And this is the quote here that part of the description is to show the third world, that the U.S. is a racial democracy, that minorities can achieve equality. Um, and so look, Asians are one of those examples. And yet at the same time, it was a, a category that was invented to discipline brown and black people, right? How dare you ask for government handouts, uh, which is part of the individuals make it because they are successful, not that there is something called systemic racism or systems, structures of power that we have inherited from the past and have been built in from the past. So the model minority always has these two aspects, right? That it selects certain groups of Asians. And if you remember from the slide before about the heterogeneity of, of, of Asians, so um, folks who have come in as refugees, like um, Southeast Asians, for example, Cambodian, Laos, uh, Laotians, Hmong, people who came in after the Vietnam War as refugees, they have not achieved economic parity with whites. Instead, they are one of the, the highest poverty groups in the U.S., much, much higher than whites. So you note here that the quote for the model minority is built on Chinese Americans. So it's Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and, and South Asians. These are the groups that after that Immigration Act of 1965 were specially selected, the term is hyper-selected, uh, to enter the U.S., not only to recruit professionals, but these are also people who are considered elite compared to their country of origin. So you have people who are selected on two different levels um, to, to enter the U.S., which seems to give credence to the model minority myth, right? That of course, look at how successful these people are. Um, I think yeah. in terms yeah. of the interest of time, I should move on. 
Yeah, while you move on, I'm just going to say to reiterate what Professor Zoe was saying, the idea of the model minority reaffirms this idea of the American dream and success story. It wasn't just even at the height of the Cold War, it's at the height of the civil rights movement, right? So it is an erasure of that history. It's an erasure of the story of white supremacist violence and exclusion. It's erasure of the past and it's being used as a weapon during the Cold War and the civil rights movement to say, no, the United States has overcome discrimination as if it's proof that the United States is not um, racist anymore, as if if racism is a problem, then it's an individual problem, right? And so this is an answer to the question by Rashini about how what does ignorance play? It's not an individual act; it is an institutional one, right? But that there are the stories that we tell, and this is why history plays an important role, is to say, oh no, it's it's we've overcome it, right? So that's um, what is the impact on generations? in America of this story. We're told not to complain or to protest, to be grateful for the opportunity to be here, even if you were born here, right? And you are told that the story that you you can't criticize, that the stories, the, the stories that you're a professional foreigner, you're told to take care of yourself and you're you're a success because you did it, right? And to adopt American racism against black Americans and others. This is fundamentally a part of that story uh, to issue uh, labor conflicts, right, to embrace um, capitalism, uh, or one would pay the price. And what it does, as Dr. Zoe was saying, is that it ignores the differences with, within the Asian American population. The, it ignores the process of selective immigration in the 20th century, especially under the 1965 Immigration Act of skilled immigrants. And this is, as I said in my lecture on Monday, an example of a story that's not authentic because history tells us that it's not authentic. The important thing about understanding the history of Asian America, particularly as this slide shows, is that it's a history of American empire. We cannot understand it without understanding the global context. If you see, look at all the, cold, the, the wars that the United States has fought in Asia in the 20th century. So Elda, if you wanna explain this slide. Okay, all right. So here, if you see um, these, uh, the and the I I I took these quotes from you know, uh, U U.S. history books describing American actions in Asia, right? So it's the post-war occupation of Japan after World War II. It's the police action in Korea, right? We're not occupying Korea. We're there to try and police the communists, right? And we're here to help Koreans. And then again, the sort of conflict in Vietnam. Um, actually, this ties to the way in which the, the United States, I think this was President McKinley upon um, acquiring the Philippines as one of our colonies, he announces in his speech where the U.S. sort of takes over formal jurisdiction that we are not here as conquerors. We are here as your friends to help protect your rights, to give you these lessons of self-determination so that you can become independent. Right. So this is that entire sort of narrative of we're not an empire. We are spreading democracy. Right. We are spreading equality. And so one thing to tie to the notion of white supremacy and the and, and the US as empire is if you look at this quote up here, um, it's the idea that if the United States is an empire, that means we can tie what has structurally happened to African Americans, to indigenous people within the so-called domestic borders of the US and tie them directly to U.S. occupation, military occupation in Asia, U.S. acquisition of territories. And where the white supremacy comes in is this, this creating of this kind of ideal, right? Speaking English, but also behaving in a certain kind of way, um, certain kinds of virtues that are defined as, you know, being independent, being individual, working hard, all of these things that can be taught. But also this privileging of, of whiteness norms, white standards of beauty, right? English speaking, um, coming from a particular kind of tradition as part and parcel of, of, of what we inherit there. Um, I think the last thing that I- The last slide, Elda? The last slide, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I wanna say is that reiterating what Dr. Zoe is saying, the reason why we called the panel um, the legacy of anti-Asian violence and not anti-Asian hate is because the idea of, and I think this gets to the question that Rashini is asking in the Q&A, is that the idea of 
of hate individualizes this idea of violence. So as Dylan Rodriguez, who's a professor at the University of Santa Barbara and a, and a, theor and a really well-known theorist, prominent theorist in this area has said recently, the individualization of anti-Asian violence distorts its institutional, cultural, and systemic dimensions while ignoring its complex historical relation to chattel slavery, anti-Blackness, colonialism, imperial war, heteronormativity, white suprem pride supremacist patriarchy, and racial capitalism. And so it, in, it encourages performative solutions to, fi to, to fix anti-Asian feelings, right, which is what, how we would define hate, as opposed to creating what he calls, quote, sustainable infrastructures of solidarity, right, that recognize that this is basically the legacy of white supremacy. What Asian Americans have done since the 20th century is to try and reclaim that label to say, no, Asian American, we, we embrace it, but they recognizing that that comes from that history of violence, of othering, of exclusion, right? Um, and so the, and I think it's important to know that events like this, we really have to question what is the role of the university? What is the role that we're playing here in how institutions can reproduce these ideas? Right, and I think that that gets to the question of what is ignorance, right? What, what, what is it that institutions do to perpetuate, and what is it that we can do in terms of uh, uh, of learning at in this place to understand what are the stories that we need to tell, are the stories that have been told to us that are not authentic. So, Elder, do you want to just wrap up with this particular? Um. Story? Yeah, so I'll connect that to this this last slide, which is what um, Dr. Pak is talking about. There's often a term that's used to describe it, which is institutionally sanctioned ignorance. That is, why haven't you learned about this in a class? Why isn't this part of a core class? Right? And this isn't just a St. John's problem, right? Why didn't you learn about this in high school, in elementary school? This is just as much of a sort of vital part of American history as the pilgrims, right? As as Columbus discovering a place that already had people. And so this is the, the question then that, you know, Dr. Pak is asking, which is, it's not just about anti-Asian violence, it's how do those institutions change in order to transform that future, right? So the last thing that I just wanted to point to is there's the, this anti-Blackness that the Asian American community kind of inherits, right, as, as part of this kind of white supremacy, but there is just as much a vital coalition and community uh, and, and interactions between Africans and, um, and Asians, right? And there are several books that have recently come out called, you know, Afro-Asia. Um, but one of the things, if you look at this quote from um, our advisor, Kerry Hokihiro, who's all over these slides, is this is how he links them together, right? He says, if you look at it through the lens of empire, we're a kindred people, we share a history of migration, interaction, and sharing. We share a history of oppression in the United States, serving as slave and cheap labor, as people who've been excluded. We share a history of struggle for freedom and the democratization of America, of demands for equality and human dignity. So this is the last part I just wanted to end on, this idea that, and I think Dr. Pak mentioned this before, about how Asian Americans litigated all of these, uh, these, these, these discriminatory laws which is African Americans and Asian Americans are a fundamental part of American history insofar as they have demanded the kind of equality that the Constitution promises to everyone. Were it not for these court cases, right, those two court cases that Professor Pak mentioned, but also the 14th Amendment, those rights and freedoms would not be guaranteed for everyone. So even though Asian Americans are statistically very, very few, right? There's about, I think, 6% of us, we make up the, the, um, the, the US population, the sort of institutional impact in terms of um, being a part of American history, demanding rights, right? That has a sort of oversized kind of, um, of influence. Thank right? you. I think that's- yeah, we, we went way over, so apologies, GM. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Alda and Susie. So, um, stop sharing your slides. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, next, uh, we are going to go uh, and ask uh, a slightly different perspective from the criminological and sociological perspective. So, how do you think about the recent events? What has changed? Are there any studies to address 
the current anti-Asian crimes. What are the problematic areas? Can mass shootings be considered differently when targeting a specific racial group? So I'd like uh, Professor Angela Zhu to address uh, this question. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see that? Yep, and then you can do um, full screen in the bottom if you would like next to the zoom on the left. Get yep, it now? Perfect. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Angela Yue Zhuo. Uh, I'm an Asian woman. Um, I'm the first generation immigrant from China. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I have black hair and uh, brown eyes. Um, I wear uh, dark blue today. Um, thanks to the um, Racial Justice Conversations Committee for having me uh, in the panel today. It's a um, great pleasure and honor. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Pat and Dr. Zhou, uh, their um, highly insightful presentation, uh, which addresses the historical and uh, institutional uh, perspective of anti-Asian um, violence. And I personally learned a lot. Um, adding to that, um, I just want to share some maybe dry, but astonishing empirical statistics uh, of anti-Asian uh, hate crimes, uh, uh, in particular in most recent years. Many of you may uh, agree, uh, currently uh, we're living amidst the twin pandemics, COVID-19 and racism. Uh, since the very beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak last January, uh, Asian Americans, along with other uh, racial groups, have been on the front line combating the pandemic and protecting American lives. Meanwhile, and very unfortunately, anti-Asian hate incidents have been rising since then for over a year. Uh, the recent horrific killing of Asian Americans by workers in Atlanta has brought about renewed frustration and exasperation as the depth and the breadth of the problems that beset our community. For decades, Asian Americans are largely invisible in national debate, invisible in the debate on race and racism, and we are considered to be statistically insignificant. While Asian Americans are a relatively small minority group, well, one of the fastest growing minority groups in the US, anti-Asian racism and violence are not new. As the Asian population increases, crimes against Asian Americans has been rising over the years. For example, the data from the NYPD indicated that Asian Americans are the only racial group that experienced increased victimization across all types of uh, criminal offense between the year of 2008 and the year of 2019. And also according to FBI, the number of hate crime incidents against the Asian American has been rising year by year in the most recent decade However, when we look at the criminology literature, there are tens of research on racism and hate crime in which Asian Americans, again, are largely invisible. So what's the nature of hate crimes against Asian Americans? In what situations did this incident happen? Well, to date, this largely remains unknown. Until very recently, uh, a handful of studies uh, have been published to break the silence fill the gap and to inform the public. Uh, for example, this January, uh, the American Journal of Criminal Justice published an article titled Hate Crimes Against Asian Americans. Using the data from US Census and the National Incident-Based Reporting System between 1992 and 2014, this is the first study that reports the nature and the characteristics of hate crimes against the racial Americans on the national scope. I just want to highlight a couple of uh, major findings of this study. Uh, first, Asian Americans experience have commonalities with other racial groups. Minority groups suffer from racism and hate crimes in general. There are many similarities between hate crimes against Asian Americans and those against African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, for example, uh, hate crimes are more likely targeting young adults ages 18 to 34, male, and local residents in all the three groups. 
and the offenders of hate crimes are more likely to be male and young. Beyond these the similarities, Asian Americans, however, have a higher chance than other minority groups to be victimized by non-white offenders, have a higher risk to be offended by strangers, and are more likely to be targeted in the school environment. So here, the model minority myth may play a role. In short, hate crimes against Asian Americans are not new. They are widespread, they are institutionally constructed, and it's an increasing problem. Since the pandemic, some government leaders and senior officials, in some instances, have directly or indirectly encouraged hate crimes and racism by using anti-Chinese rhetoric. Hate crimes against Asian Americans have been surging in the U.S. Last month, the Center for the Study of Hate and Ex Extremism at the California State University San Bernardino released a report. It indicates last year, hate crimes overall in all major U.S. cities declined by 6%. But meanwhile, anti-Asian hate crimes increased by 145%. In New York City, there were three reported anti-Asian hate crimes in the year of 2019, but last year, this number jumped to 20. And that's during the time where all the total hate crimes in New York City decreased by 38%. Well, this year, the first quarter from January to March, we already see 33 reported anti-Asian Ireland uh, incidents. A research team at the University of Maryland, Maryland conducted studies to examine the COVID-19 related racism among Chinese American families. In their sample, more than three quarters of parents and more than three quarters of youth reported at least one incident of COVID-19 related racial discrimination, either online or in person. So on top of all these uh, astonishing uh, statistics, we should be aware that most of the studies, in particular the official statistics, are very limited. They rely on reported cases. So there's a long stand, lasting uh, problem of underreporting for hate crimes, in particular uh, among the Asian American communities. So as an individual, what can we do? First and foremost, we have to stand up and speak out. We have to stand in solidarity with other minority groups to fight against racism and hate crimes. Hate crimes have a broader effect than most other kinds of crime. Hate crime victims include not only the crimes immediate target, but also others like them. Hate crimes affect families, communities, and at times the entire nation. It's critical to report hate crimes not only to show support and get help from victims, but also to send a clear message that the community will not tolerate this kind of crime. Reporting hate crimes allows communities and law enforcement to fully understand the scope of the problem and to put resources toward preventing and addressing uh, these problems. And on this slide, I listed uh, the websites, the hate crime reporting websites of New York State, NYPD, and MTA. They have uh, clear instructions and tapes, and some of you, if you want to um, uh, learn uh, 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 these uh, tapes, you may want to uh, look at this website. For example, uh, if you are being subjected to a hit crime, what could we do, right? Uh, call 911 or call the uh, uh, phone number uh, listed in the website. And if there's any uh, witness to the crime, um, if possible, try to get their uh, content uh, details and try to share that with the police. And in many times, probably we may uh, um, witness a, a hate crime. And every situation, every situation is different. And uh, be very careful and only intervene uh, if you think it's safe. But if it's safe, you know, try to help. Observe what happened and listen to what's being said. And if possible, if it's not dangerous, uh, take a photo if you can. Uh, pay attention to you know, as many details as possible, write them down as soon as you can, and then share with the police um, what you saw or you, what you saw or you heard. 
and if possible, if uh, it's safe for you, ask the person who appears to be the victim, you know, ask them if they're okay, if there's anything you know, we can help, and, and if it's no danger, help them out. And um, I guess I will stop here, and uh, during the Q&A session, we can talk more about the uh, law enforcement issues. Now, let me turn to the floor to Dr. K. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zero. That was wonderful. Um, so, just going on to the our next uh, speaker, uh, we want to ask: What are the impacts? What are the consequences, both uh, social but also health and uh, related economic? We pose these questions to Professor Christine Chim, who's been researching on the health outcomes of racism. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I'm going to share my screen. So, thank you again to my fellow colleagues on, um, and, and and for the organizers for putting this panel together. My name is uh, Christine Chem. I'm an associate professor with the Department of Clinical Health Professions in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences and a PharmD alum of our uh, PharmD program at St. John's. Um, I am uh, an Asian American woman um, with shoulder length black hair and dark brown eyes. Um, and today I am wearing a dark purple top. My affirming pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, today I, I'd like to address the impact of the anti-Asian violence on health both physically and mentally. So in order to understand the impact of violence on health, we have to understand the significance of social determinants as the background and the foundation for the, the impact. Uh, social determinants of health as defined by the World Health Organization are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, play, and age. Oops, sorry. Um, and, and these circumstances influence health and health outcomes. These circumstances could be social, economic, um, and physical environments, and they all have tremendous effects on, on our health. Individually, unfavorable characteristics related to education, employment, food security, transportation, housing, income, and social support have each been associated with poor health outcomes. They can affect anybody regardless of your age, your race, your ethnicity, and they're a major cause of health and equities and health disparities. Research actually shows that only 20% of somebody's health outcomes is attributed to clinical care, um, which includes access to the health system and quality of healthcare services. However, a staggering 80% of one's health outcomes are attributed to social economic factors and health behaviors. When you break it down further, uh, that 80% that further, 40% is attributed to the social economic factors, which can include one's education, their job status, family social support, income, and the safety of their community. 10% is attributed to their physical environment, such as where they live and their overall neighborhood and environment. And then 30% is attributed to one's health behaviors, which include diet and exercise. So although anti-Asian violence and discrimination have always existed, as we've heard from the other panelists, it's quite worsened over the past year um, and thereby has negatively affected are a social determinants of health, essentially the way Asians live, work, play, and eat, um, which then ultimately will affect their health outcomes. So when health is poor, medical complications increase, hospital admission rates go up, medical costs will increase, and mortality rates will go up. So what examples of social determinants are being impacted by the rise of anti-Asian violence? So if we break it down further, Let's look at economic stability. One, researchers, scholars will say that economic stability or specifically employment essentially dictates the rest of the determinants. 
when you have a job, you can afford a home. When you have a home, I mean, when you have a, a job, you can afford food. You can afford pretty much everything to survive. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people have lost their jobs. There's been a surge of unemployment. Um, businesses have, have closed down. Uh, people have lost their jobs. Um, a lot of uh, non-essential businesses have shuttered down and have struggled to, to resurface um, as lockdown orders are starting to loosen up. Specifically, um, in the Asian community, many Asians own small businesses. Uh, they are usually um, work for industries that are service oriented. So think about, you know, restaurants or personal services like salons, um, you know, in, in the hospitality industry, the retail industry, the leisure industry, um, other um, laundromats, um, elderly care, a lot of these um, businesses unfortunately shuttered down. And so because of loss of business, the Asian community impacted by their loss of business are probably not able to, you know, pay rent or, or pay for things like uh, groceries or access medical care. And so employment uh, makes a huge difference in the rest of um, the, the determinants of health. Um, studies are showing that uh, the Asian American population has the largest income in inequality. Um, it has the largest income gap in the United States. And so, you know, and the model minority has to do with, with this um, perception that Asian Americans are well off. They're they're not weak. They they can fend for themselves. Um, they they made it. They they made it in in America. So they they don't need any help. Um, but unfortunately, although there, there is a subset of the Asian American population that's wealthy, there's also a large portion of that population that, that is poor, that has not accumulated wealth over the generation. Um, particularly in, in the immigrant community, um, a lot of our elderly uh, Asian Americans are most vulnerable to this. Um, and so, Compounded that with by, by that is is the fact that a lot of immigrants have limited English proficiency, and so um, with that is the education uh, determinant. Um, when when patients, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, when individuals have limited English proficiency, don't speak English as their first language, it's very hard to navigate um, through circumstances like these. Think about the pandemic. Um, my husband is uh, works for the Department of Labor, and um, he's been seeing thousands and thousands of cases of unemployment. For the native English speaker, it is very difficult to navigate through applying for unemployment benefits. So think about those who don't speak English. They are probably not even going to apply for unemployment benefits because it, it's too overwhelming um, to, to apply and to, to re review all the paperwork and things like that. And they might not have family who, who can um, fill out the paperwork for them. Um, with the, the violence that's, that's rising, um, safety becomes an issue. Transportation becomes an issue um, because of all of the attacks that have been occurring in urban environments and even on subway stations and uh, subway uh, trains. Um, a lot of Asian Americans are, are struggling to get out of their home. They don't, they don't want to leave for fear of um, attacks, for fear of violence. Um, they just don't feel safe. And even though there are personal ride um, services like Uber, um, when we think about our elderly Asians, they might not even have a smartphone or access to um, some kind of electronic device to have an app downloaded like Uber to get to their medical appointments. And so this will eventually affect health because if they're not going to go out and leave their home to go to a, a doctor's visit, um, whether it's fear of contracting COVID or fear of violence, they're not going to make health a priority. And so their health outcomes are going to, to diminish. Similarly, they're also not leaving because 
um, due to fear of uh, violence. And so with that comes food insecurity. A lot of our Asian Americans prefer um, food that is, uh, that is within their culture, right? So um, a lot of grocery stores that are catered to the Asian community will provide them the, the food that they need, but if they're not gonna be leaving, they're not going to be eating. Um, or because of the lack of employment, they're not able to afford healthy food. And so we see rise, a rise in diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease as a result of food insecurity. Social, social isolation is an issue when it comes to safe, safety. Um, because again, people are not leaving their homes for fear of violence and discrimination. Um, people are already not leaving their homes because of COVID. And so the fear of violence is making that worse. Um, and so a lot of people also might not exercise. Uh, some people thrive on their daily walks, you know, regardless of um, what the weather is like, but they're likely not going to leave because of the, the fear of violence. And so uh, a lot of these social determinants are going to be affected because of racism and violence. The last thing I wanna talk about is the impact on mental health. Um, as we all know, the pandemic has been extremely stressful and it has caused an increase in mental health issues. Um, but with the increase in, in violence and racism and discriminatory acts against Asian Americans, um, there has been a rise in mental health issues among the Asian American community. Um, historically, it, mental health issues have been uh, stigmatized as issues that shouldn't be talked about. Um, it's not something that families will talk about. Um, because it demonstrates weakness. Uh, silence, rather, on the other hand, was a form of, of resilience. And so because of that, mental health issues in the Asian American community is actually underreported. Um, additionally, due to language barriers, um, Asians are likely not submitting data into studies that demonstrate that there are mental health issues um, and so when you think about, again, the model minority myth and how Asians are, have made it in, in the United States, um, a lot of studies actually do not reflect uh, the mental health of Asians. Um, and so this is something that we have to think about in, in, when, it, when it comes to healthcare. Um, clinicians should be screening uh, for, for their patients' uh, mental health uh, status. Um, and we should do a better job in, in making sure that mental health services are, um, are accessible and uh, culturally uh, sensitive for our Asian American community. Um, I'm gonna stop there because for the sake of time, we might have some questions and I can elaborate a little bit further um, as far as the impact on mental health but I just wanted to make sure that there was some um, time for questions from um, anybody in the audience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chim. Uh, so we have uh, three minutes left. So actually what we're going to do is to um, take the audience questions and give it to uh, our panelists to actually answer them individually because we have to wrap up the session. So we are going to actually end with one question to each of our panelists. What are the hopeful signs already manifested that are leading us? Christine, since you're on, why don't you go first? Christine, I don't know if you, um, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi. So I think from um, a health standpoint, I, I definitely see a lot of medical um, and medical professionals, um, schools, and curricula are changing to um, 
builds in learning around social determinants and allowing for future clinicians to assess social determinants um, because as we saw before, 80% of one's health outcomes are attributed to you know, social economic factors and behavioral factors and not just, you know, so the, and not just the quality of care that we're pro providing, but holistically thinking about the patients in front of us, who, they're, who they are, where, where they come from, what their stories are, um, um, what they're going through in uh, on a social level, uh, on a behavioral level is, is really critical. And so I, I see hope in, in just our future, the future generation of our healthcare providers who are learning now to incorporate this into their patient encounters. Angela, same question. What are the hopeful signs already manifested that lead us? Um, I see for the first time, um, Asian American stand in the front line of national debate. And um, I'm highly impressed by the young activists. And also, you know, um, as a first generation immigrant on some social media, I'm very happy to see more and more first generation uh, Asian immigrants start to reflect Black Life, Black Life Matters. And they start to step out to communicate with other minority groups to improve their understanding of American history and the history of all the minority groups. And I see the hope for all of us to stand together and to stand in solidarity to fight against racism and hate crimes. Thank you. Okay, Elda. Okay, um, I suppose the signs of hope are sparse, but I suppose they're there. Um, for example, there's a lot of new research happening. Um, there's one researcher at the University of Michigan who just started tracking um, the hate crimes against Asians in 2020 and found that 90% of those hate crimes were committed by white people and only 5% by black people. So that both fights against the anti-blackness that Asians seem to naturally have, but also show you that, you know, white supremacy is, is the real issue, right? But there's not a lot of data on this and it's just beginning. So I would say that would be a sign of hope. Susie, same question. What are the signs of hope that lead us? Well, I think it's important for us to remember that we do have a tradition that we can draw on. We're not reinventing the wheel today, right? That's one of the things that we've talked about. And that's one of the things that our history helps us to see. At the same time, I would agree with Elda. I think that there's a growing awareness of Asian American responsibility and recognition of complicity and anti-blackness and frankly, solidarity that also has a tradition, right? If we look at the work, for example, of Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama, it's there, but it really wasn't there in that, in the same way that it is today with Black Lives Matter. Then, for example, during the Los Angeles riots or when um, uh, Latasha Harlins was murdered, um, or in, you know, in the in the late 80s and the early 90s. And this is actually when I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school to study Asian American history. And so I see that that conversation, I think, with the kind of rising generation that people have been talking about um, uh, is 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 changing. And I see, you know, I see that on social media, but also I also I want to. Uh, note that Professor Rodriguez um, also looks at organizations like AAPI Women Lead um, and the work that people are doing on the ground, really centering the um, on the ground solidarities of, of, for example, mutual aid organizations that focus on solidarity. And I think that that is very hopeful. And I hope that people will, because the resources are out there, and I want you to know that you are not alone. Um, and that there are many people working in this space where you can also find community. Thank you. So, uh, there were a few questions in the audience uh, from the students uh, asking about um, uh, courses at St. John's uh, relating to race and ethnic studies. So, I just want to let you know that there is a new minor, which you can actually minor in called CRESS, Critical Race and ethnic studies. And I'm going to turn to Blanche and she's gonna sh show uh, a slide about that. 
as uh, she closed. I'm going to turn the mic over to Blanche. Thank you. Um, great. I think as we close today's event, um, I think I speak on behalf of all the students here that we really appreciate everyone's vulnerability and passion about this topic and commitment to this event. So thank you to Dr. Kim, Dr. Chim, Dr. Pak, Dr. Tso, and Dr. Zuo for leading this conversation. We'd also like to thank our presenters, Professor Marshall and Father Tree. And we also appreciate the Racial Justice Committee, Manushka Kasanyo, Rita Torsney Sullivan, and Anna Zak for working to put the session together. And I'd also like to thank all of the 89 attendees for joining today's session. Today's video will be posted a week from today and can be rewatched and shared with others. Just visit stjohns.edu slash racial justice. The committee is working to continue these conversations next semester. Check the website for updates on future scheduled sessions. But once again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to our panelists and our discussants, our moderators, and all the hard work for the organizers for putting this event together. And thank you very much, Blanche. Thank you, Blanche. Thank you, Gian. Yes, thank you. Thank Bye you. now. Bye. Thank you.